Hello everyone. So welcome to the course on biostatistics. So let's start with the lecture one. Let's talk about. Let's uh, introduce. So I'll introduce you to biostatistics. So statistics is the study of collection, organization, analysis, and interpretation and presentation of data. So when you think of statistics, most people think of analysis, but statistics play, plays a key role in all of the processes that involve in the collection, in the study of data. So study of data in simple, so statistics comes from the word statistics, uh, basically means the study of data. So it deals with all aspects of this, including the planning of the data and collection in terms of the design of surveys and experiments. So for example, if you wanted to conduct a survey you know, on a particular uh, hypothesis that you wanted to understand, say for example, uh, you wanted to know how many people in your class smoked uh, you know, or vaped, you wanted to know like what kind of a survey you want to conduct or what is the planning uh, that you want to do and what type of data that you want to collect. So this is an example of uh, understanding statistics or if you're in a hospital, you want to know how many people, uh, you know, how uh, how fast are their patients recovering? And depending on the type of surgery they went through, you can consider that also to be a consideration of a study of data. Now let's focus on biostatistics. So biostatistics basically defines that it's the application of mathematical tools used in statistics to the field of biology and medicine. So it's the study of statistics as applied to the biological area. So biological laboratory experiments, medical research, Health services research also use all use the same statistical methods that we generally use uh, in statistics. So the tools of statistics are generally employed in many business, many fields. So we can use them in business, we use them in education, we use them in psychology, agriculture, and economics. So when the data analyzed are derived from biological sciences and medicine, so that term biostatistics is used to distinguish this, the particular application of statistical tools and concepts. So what are the main concerns of biostatistics? So what, what are we looking for forward to in biostatistics? So it's a field of study that's concerned with mainly the collection of data, organization and summarization of data, summarization and analysis of data. And this com combination of collection, organization, summary, summarization and analysis is called destructive statistics. So in simple words, you can write it as SICOSA. All right, collection, organization, summarization, and analysis. So that is called as descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics is involved in the collection, organization, summarization, and analysis of data. The other type of study, the other form of statistics is called inferential statistics, is where we draw inferences. Inferences basically meaning that decisions. So we are trying to make decisions using statistical data. So about a body of data is basically called as inferential statistics. So, so ability to make decisions from data. So it's called inferential statistics. Understanding the, sub, the collection, organization, summarization, and analysis is descriptive statistics. So that's the difference in bias. So we can, do, do, we can differentiate bias statistics into two parts, descriptive and inferential statistics. Now let's talk about in general, what is biostatistics mainly used for? Biostatistics mainly used is used for research studies. So let's talk about what is a research study specifically. So a research study basically is a scientific study of a phenomenon of interest. For example, if you wanted to study uh, the efficacy of a drug or the safety of a drug, you're gonna have to conduct a research study. So what are the phases that involved inside a research study? So the first phase is planning and designing of an experiment or a survey. Number two is the collection of data. Number three is the analysis using statistical tools. Number four is the interpretation of data. And finally, how to present a valid conclusion. For example, if you see in the news that you know eating a particular food reduces the chance of cancer by say 20% or 30%. So that is what is the representation of presentation here. So presentation is basically giving you a valid conclusion that everybody can easily understand from the data that you have made out. Now, let's talk about data in general. So data is basically numbers which can be obtained from measurements or by counting. 
So when you take measurement, what is an example of measurement? For example, a nurse weighs a patient or takes a patient's temperature or a measurement consisting of a number such as 150 pounds or 100 degrees or 100 Fahrenheit is basically measurement. What is counting? Counting is when a hospital administrator counts the number of patients, perhaps 20, that are discharged from the hospital on a given day. Counting involves data that you are counting by the by each individual case. Measurements are values that are already assigned in a predetermined unit. So values with units. So here it's just you values. So each of the above three is what we call a datum. And the three taken together is called as data. So combination of everything comes it combines it to be a data. So what are the common sources of data? So there are four common sources. So, so there are many of them. So these are the common ones. The first one is routinely kept records, surveys, experiments, and reports. So let's talk about each one. Routinely kept records. An example of that would be think about hospital medical records or your own medical records at your doctor. Or you can think of, uh, you know, your financial record. Your bank statements can be considered as a routinely kept record of financial financials. So this is an example of routinely kept records. So hospital medical records, and they contain immense amount of information on the patients. So hospital accounting records contain the wealth of the data on the facilities, business activities. Next, let's talk about second form, surveys. The administrator of a clinic, so when he wants to obtain information regarding the mode of transportation that is used by the patients to visit the clinic. So if the admission forms do not contain a question on the mode of transportation, we may conduct a survey among the patients to obtain this information. So when you do not know a particular information and you want to conduct a survey to understand that particular information. So those types of uh, informations are generally called surveys. So where you try and ask people about a certain thing to you know let them answer and that you note it down is called as a survey the third one is experiments and the most common ones so for example if a nurse wanted to know which of the several strategies is best for maximizing patient compliance so the nurse might conduct an experiment in which she uses you know, different strategies of motivating compliance and then finally subsequent the evaluated the, the responses to the different strategies and then enable the nurse to decide which is the most effective form of you know uh, understanding of the for example let's say you conducted uh, you know you wanted to conduct data on a drug trial so what are you going to do you can do you know experiments where you give some people uh, half the people uh, the drug half the people placebo and expect which of them will produce the uh, a result that you you would like or you wanted to see whether the drug actually cures the patient you wanted to know like you have to conduct a random study where you give some people the drug, some people do not give the drug, and finally find out if the people who are give, being given the drug will improve, while the people who are not given the drug will still deteriorate. So this is the example of an experiment. The fourth one are reports. So reports are basically, think of it like data banks, or research literature, or published reports. So these are all sources of published data where you consider data. Okay. What are the types of data? So there are two types of data. There are constants and variables. A constant, basically, as the name suggests, is something that does not change. So a constant only has one value or one attribute. And any, val any variable can be made into a constant by reducing its expression to one of its values. For example, if you consider a single person, uh, gendering him would make it easier for you to understand that it's a constant because it's, uh, you know, his gender cannot change a lot. So it's not a variable that generally changes. So you can consider that to be a constant. So a constant in general has no use in statistics. So that is anything that is remaining constant cannot be subjected to statistical analysis. So constants are not commonly used in uh, statistical analysis. For example, if you consider the room temperature you know, at 35 degrees centigrade during an experiment, so the temperature becomes, so in this case, the temperature stops being a variable. So you can consider any variable can be converted into a constant if you keep it long enough constant in the experiment. The next one is a variable. So this is the one that we are going to, going to use a lot. So if you observe a particular characteristic and we find that it takes on 
at different values in different persons and places or things. So we can label that as a variable. For example, a person's blood pressure, a person's heart rate, a per the person's height, a person's weight, you know, the age can be considered to be uh, variable. Where you consider that, it can change regularly and it's always going to be, you know, changing, varying from object to object. So one, one person to another person, it always changes. So a variable is always a quantity that generally varies from object to object that you generally consider. So there are two types of variables. One is what we call a quantitative variable and qualitative variable. The name itself says quantitative variable refers to the quantity. Qualitative variable looks at the quality. What does that mean quantity and quantity? Quality. A quantitative variable is where the measurement is generally done in the usual sense. So and a quantitative variable that ha it has generally has a values that are intrinsically numerical. So there is nothing extrinsically numerical about it. So it's always uh, based on a number. So measurements that are made on quantitative variables always convey information regarding the amount. So we can obtain measurements on the heights of adults or the weight of preschool children or the ages of patients seen in a clinic or the number of children in a family. All of these are generally considered to be quantitative variables. Next, let's look at qualitative variables. Qualitative variable basically has values that are intrinsically non-numerical and the measurements made on qualitative variables convey information regarding attributes. Understand this word attribute is important. Attribute can be considered as some sort of uh, you know defining feature of that particular quantity. So qualitative variables are things like a person's color, uh, you know, color of a person's hair or the gender of a child or the cause of death of a newborn or the province of residence of a particular citizen. So you can consider any of these to be, you know, a value that can be considered as the main sense with, or the value considered as a qualitative variable. So whenever we determine the height, weight or age of an individual, the result is frequently referred to as the value of the respective variable. So when the values obtained arise as a result of chance factors so that they cannot be exactly predicted in advance. So whenever you cannot predict anything in advance, that type of variable is called as a random variable. So a random variable, the main purpose of a random, random variable is that it should be unpredictable. Right? So it should be unpredictable. So only then you can consider it to be a random variable. So the observations or measurement in general are always taken to obtain a random variable. For example, a person's height, because we never, you know, pre predict a person's height, we always have to measure it. So we always consider that to be a random variable. So when your child is born and we cannot predict exactly his or her, you know, his or her length and maturity, so consider that to be a random variable. And the same way, attained adult health is the result of numerics, uh, general and the genetic and environmental factors. So that's the reason why the adult height of a person is generally considered to be a random variable because we cannot predict it exactly at what point, what would be the height of a person. Next, there are two types of random variables in nature. One is what we call a discrete random variable and a continuous random variable. Discrete always refers to the idea that it's a value that referred determined by gaps or interruptions, which means that these are distinct values. So distinct from each other. Right? And they are also finite. So it means that there are a specific set, set of uh, values. So those values are generally called as discrete random variables. So these gaps or interruptions indicate that there is an absence of values between particular values that the variable can assume. An example of that would be the number of daily admissions in a hospital can, can be considered to be a discrete random variable because there is always going to be a finite number. Right? So when you consider uh, the number of admissions, you cannot give a number like 1.5 or 2.997 or 3.33 because these are not the values that you can get when you have, when you consider the number of daily admissions of a general hospital. And the number of decayed, missing or filled teeth per child in an elementary school is also another example of discrete random variable. Again, this cannot change easily. So you cannot have, you know, a person having, uh, you know, five teeth at uh, nine o'clock and then 10 teeth at, uh, you know, two o'clock. So there's always some sort of a 
you know an idea of how the, the decaying process occurs in teeth so this is the common sense of a discrete random variable next let's look at a continuous random variable where will you see a continuous variable so understand that this is something that has to change as well as something you cannot predict and also should be continuous continuous meaning that it should always have it should generally have no interruptions so a continuous random variable generally should not have any gaps or interruptions and it can assume any value within a specific relevant interval assumed by the variable for example you can consider the person's height weight and skull circumference can be considered as a, a continuous random variable one another one that you can consider is the diastolic blood pressure a person's heart rate all of these can be considered to be a continuous random variable because these are things that all that are always there and cannot be predicted at any given point of time and they are always changing so this is an example of a continuous random variable now in statistics we are always focusing on a specific uh, you know idea of what we do to a particular uh, you know what we do in a particular study and in every statistical study we are focused on what we call the population now population in the statistical sense does not mean the same in the natural sense so the average person in general should think of a population as a collective entity or usually generally people but in terms of a population or a collective of entities so they can consist of animals machines places or cells so the population of values is basically at the largest collection of values of a particular random variable for which we have a particular time uh, interest in a, at a particular amount of time so populations can be finite or infinite populations why is that the case for example if i have population values of heart rates of many people that's an infinite value so you cannot have you know a stopping point at at a, part, at a particular point of time if you have a population of values considered as a fixed number of these values so the population is said to be finite and if you have a population that consists of endless succession the population values are infinite so we are interested in weight of all children enrolled in a certain country elementary school system so our population consists of all these weights but so but every time we focus on a population because populations are too large of values we cannot analyze the data from populations what we generally do is we pick a small part of the population and assume that it can represent the entire population so that particular part of the population that we is used to understand the population is called as the sample so sample is basically a part of the population used for analysis So basically a certain part of the population that we are using for analysis for example if you consider the weights of all elementary school children enrolled in a certain country so if we collect the analysis of weights of only a fraction of these children so we only have a part of the population of a weight so we can call that a sample so for example if you wanted to test a particular new uh, you know heart medication and you wanted to know whether it works or not to test that drug you cannot go out giving around every person the same drug and check if it works and you cannot also find every person who has a certain heart uh, you know arrhythmia or heart uh, stroke so what you are going to do now is you are going to choose a small subset of the population of people who have had certain uh, you know heart problems and you are going to give them the medication and you are going to assume that if it works in the sample it should work in the population so understanding how to infer data from the pop from the sample to the population is basically called as statistics or the inferential statistics basically so inferential statistics what we do there is we analyze the sample first and then we try to use the sample as a source of inspiration to understand how it would do in a population next let's talk about sampling so sampling basically is the reference to the collection of data in a discrete manner so where we are trying to connect collect the data separately and out of each other next measurements so any measurement is basically defined as an assigned number or assignment to numbers to objects or events according to a set of rules so there are generally four types of measurement scales so from the fact that measurement may be carried under different set of rules so first one is the nominal scale ordinal scale interval scale and the ratio scale so let's discuss the scales of measurement so there are four types of four scales nominal scale 
ordinal scale, interval scale, and the ratio scale. So to summarize all of these, I've uh, given out a small table so you can see what differentiates these each of them. A nominal scale basically says that how is one different from the other? How are values different? So understand that whenever we say the word different, it doesn't mean that there is something better or something less. For example, if you consider a marital status, when you consider marital status, you can have single, divorced, married, not married. Understand that each of them do not have any significant uh, numerical difference between them, but they do have a specific attribute to each of the possibilities that are there. The same way with eye color. They can be green, blue, you know, they can be a person with black eyes, they can be a person with brown eyes. You know, there are chances that, you know, we're basically looking at how is A different from B? Gender, male and female. We cannot change, numerically differentiate between male and female. So both of the same value as a number. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's uh, one is better than the other. So in the same way with religious affiliation, for example, a person can be an atheist, person can be a Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jain, Buddha, you know, you can have any number of versions of religious affiliation. But here, the primary point to remember in a nominal uh, category, a nominal scale, is that we do not have, you know, a size difference or relativity be between these quantities, meaning that one is not better than the other, and we cannot define it that way as well. The same with race as well. Next, ordinal scale. Ordinal scale refers to the idea of differentiating by size. So by size or by relative size. So here we are talking about relative differentiation. So what does that mean? Here we are talking about which is bigger than the other. For example, when you have a stage of disease, a person can be in stage one, which is a minor stage, to stage four, which is in metastasis, so this are uh, for, you know much of one is much more worse than the other. So which means that we are saying that is A bigger than B. Next severity of pain. For example, if a person complains that he has a, you know on a pain scale, he has a pain of about five, and another person complaining that he has a pain of about ten, is much different from one another. So here we are talking about a relative differences between the values. And the same way with the level of satisfaction, can one can be you know really dissatisfied to a person can be really satisfied. So you can have any of these values between them. So this is an ordinal scale. Next, interval scale. So interval scale basically says that how many units do A and B differ in? So here we have a unit, a value, and we are talking about the difference. Here we are not talking about one bigger than the other, and we cannot say anything else. So next, temperature scale. In this, in interval scale, an example of that would be temperature scale. Now what differentiates temperature scale from other uh, you know ordinal or nominal scales because this has a particular set of values so it has a particular set of values and we can differentiate a person with you know say 98 degree fahrenheit having a body temperature of 98 degree fahrenheit to a person of having about 100 degree fahrenheit meaning that there is a change and we can note the change in specific number of units next SAT scores. So SAT scores are also differentiated on the same basis. For example, a student who gets, you know, 1200 is much more different from a student who gets 1400. So here we are differentiating based on a certain value. Next is ratio. Ratio refers to how many times bigger is a particular value in comparison to the other value. So one way of differentiating an interval and a ratio scale. So there is no zero value. So there is no zero value in interval scale and there is no negative values as well. So there is no negative values. So the, sorry, there can be negative values. But in ratio, the values generally range from zero to one. So zero and above, let me call it that way which means that the minimum value is zero always. So here there is no minimum value. For example, if you take a temperature scale in degree centigrade, there can be negative temperature, there can be positive temperature. But if you take a ratio scale, ratio scale specifically defines it as the minimum value is zero and there is no limit to the maximum value. 
So an example of that would be distance, length, time until death, and also weight. All of these values are considered to be ratio values, which means that we are saying how many times is a particular value in comparison to the other value. So the nominal scale is simply the naming scale. So practice of using names, for example, like dichotomies. So contrast and opposites, male, female, well and sick, 65, above 65, child, adult, married, not married. So all of these are nominal scales. Ordinal scales, convalescing or recovering patients may be characterized as unimproved, improved and much improved. So basically it's expanding the nominal scale. You can classify individuals based on socioeconomic status such as low, medium and high. The intelligence of a children can be measured as average, above average, average, above average and below average. So you can have, you know, multiple scales. Interval scale uses basically a more sophisticated version of, uh, you know, or nominal or ordinary scale. So here we are taking a specific measurement. So an example would be to take the word degree. So the point of coverage, we are choosing an arbitrarily chosen zero degrees, so which does not indicate there is no heat at all. So there is heat, but we are saying that there is no zero heat. So you can never have zero heat. The ratio scale here has a true zero point. That's one. And it can generally not have negative values. And the highest level of measurement is the ratio scale. So you can clarify this because the equality of ratios as well as the equality of intervals may be determined using a ratio scale. So most common traits such as height, weight, length, all of them use ratio scales. So whenever we say a person, you know, a particular body has zero height, it means that there is nothing there. So that's how we can differentiate. Next, what is statistical inference? So inference is referred to the word decisions. So statistical inference is the procedure by which we reach a conclusion or a decision about a population on the basis of information that you contain in a sample that has been drawn from that population. So what we do here is from the population, we take a sample, we analyze the sample, and then infer on the same population, so infer based on the, so we infer conclusions on the same population pack again. This process is called statistical inference. Next, what is a simple random sample? So it's important to understand a random sample from a random variable. So a random sample basically consists of what we call scientific sampling. So scientific sampling of a population is to make a valid inference. So valid inferences means that it should have no bias. So there should not be any bias. So what is the simplest form of understanding a, you know, a random a simple random sample? Let's say if you have a total of population n. So this is the total population. And from that, we have taken a small sample, small n. And the chance of having, for example, let's say, if you had, uh, you know, let's say 100 people in a class, and I've only chosen 10 people. If each one of the 10 have the same chance of being selected, that is called as a simple random sample. So each of these samples, any person inside that particular population has the same chance of being selected and nobody has any advantage, that is called as a simple random sample. So the mechanics of sample, drawing a sample to satisfy the definition of a simple random sample is called as simple random sample. Next, experiments. So experiments are special type of research study, so in which we are taking observations that are made after specific manipulation of conditions and you can carry that have been carried out so that they provide a foundation for scientific research. Why do we need to understand all this? So because every time we take up a research study, we always use what we call the scientific method. The scientific method is basically a process by which we take scientific information and collect, analyze and report in order to produce unbiased and replicable, replicable results. So remember that this is important, meaning that, for example, if you if you die, if you have done certain experiments and you end up with having a particular result, then a person repeating the experiment must also get the same result. This is the process of scientific method. So and 
the main the main reason it is done is to provide an accurate representation of the observable phenomenon so the scientific method is generally recognized universally as the only truly acceptable way to produce new scientific understanding of the world that that is around us so it is based on empirical approach and in that decisions and outcomes are reached based on data so what are the you know parts of the scientific method first we make an observation next we formulate a hypothesis number 3 we perform the experiment number 4 we analyze the data and finally report your findings and finally six invite others to reproduce the results so let's talk about each part of the scientific method there are four main key elements that are associated with the scientific method first one is making an observation second is to formulate the hypothesis three is to design an experiment and four is to conclude let's talk about one one by one making an observation so whenever you make an observation you make based on a phenomenon or a group of phenomena so the observation should lead to a formulation of questions or uncertainties that can be answered in a scientifically rigorous way for example when you take uh, you know exercise so it's observable that regular exercise reduces body weight in many people so it's also readily observable that changing diet may have a similar effect now we are taking two observable phenomena one is regular exercise and number two is diet change and that have the same end point since so the same end point is to reduce body weight so the nature of in this end point can be determined by the use of the scientific method so the observation leads to a certain next what does it lead to it formulates a hypothesis in this method we are trying what we are doing is we have to formulate a hypothesis so hypothesis basically is an explanation of the observation and to make quantitative predictions of the new observations so you are basically they explaining what is happening and you are replicating whatever is happening and predicting what can happen so often hypotheses are generated as a result of extensive background research and literature reviews so this objective is to produce hypotheses that are scientifically sound so this is important you cannot have a hypothesis that cannot be scientifically sound so hypotheses are generally stated as either a research hypothesis or a statistical hypothesis a research hypothesis looks somewhat like this where you say that exercise appears to reduce body weight but a statistical hypothesis uses statistical data to represent the same information that the research hypothesis says for example a research the statistical hypothesis looks somewhat like the average loss of body weight of the people who have exercised is greater than the average loss of body weight of people who do not exercise this is an example of a statistical hypothesis next after formulating the hypothesis we have to design an experiment so this is the third step of the scientific method that it involves designing an experiment provided that it will yield the data that is necessary to validly test an appropriate statistical hypothesis so the design of an experiment depends on the type of data the type of data that is needed to collect and to test a specific hypothesis so improperly designed experiments are the leading cause of invalid results and also unjustified conclusions so the better you design the experiment the better the chance of having to prove your hypothesis next finally conclusion in the execution of research studies one would have hoped to have a collected the data necessary to draw conclusions with some degree of confidence about the hypothesis that were posed as a part of the design so it's often the case that hypothesis in general have to be modified and they have to be retested the reason is because you might not have you might have a flawed hypothesis so what we'll do here is if your experiment fails to explain what the hypothesis you have what you're going to do is you're going to redo the hypothesis and retest again so until you make a hypothesis so that it can produce a good experimental result so whatever the conclusions of the scientific process however so the results are rarely considered to be conclusive because the result need to be replicated this is the important point so unless you can replicate it there is no chance that you can say that you have scientific credulence right so unless you will only be granted scientific credulence if some somebody else can replicate the result that you have produced so that is the final process of the scientific method so with that we end the lecture so i'll see you again in the next lecture